City University Television presents The American Theatre Wing Seminars Working in the Theatre This seminar, producing Welcome once more to the American Theatre Wing Seminars on Working in the Theatre, which are in its 19th year. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, which is located in Times Square, the heart of the theatre, 42nd Street. Broadway, off-Broadway, and off-off-Broadway all come together to present the magic of theatre. And from here, across the country, goes the best of the New York theatre, and from the regional theaters and the university theaters come their wares to seed and nurture the Broadway theater. We have many programs. The Wing is a year-round program. We're perhaps noted best for our Tony Awards, and you'll probably hear a great deal about the Tony Award, which is the highest honor given in the theater. You'll hear a great deal, most likely, from the producers on the economic value of the award, but it wasn't created for that reason. It's become so. It's become important economically for a show, but creatively it is the reason for the award. It's given for those who have achieved a degree of excellence in the craft of theater, not for the longest run, the biggest box office, or the best reviews, but because they have achieved excellence. And throughout the years, of the American Theatre Wings programs, we continue to strive for that excellence. We continue to serve the community through the theatre, our, through our many programs. These seminars, which attempt to give you what it is, a look at behind the scenes of what it is to work in the theatre, from the performer's viewpoint, from the playwright, director, and the producers. And our theater programs are many that serve the community. Saturday Theater for Children program, hospital shows that go into nursing homes and aid centers, and then introduction to Broadway, which with the great generosity of the producers has been able to provide tens of thousands of tickets for youngsters from the high schools in New York City to come to see a Broadway show. And so I'm going to get on now with this seminar, which is on the production. What it is, the nitty gritty parts of putting a show together. Performers can perform for their friends and playwright directors can have readings in their homes if necessary or houses that we've heard. But to get it on stage, you need the producer. And that's who we have today. The producers of Crazy For You, now playing on Broadway. Jean Dalrymple, will introduce I'm her part of the panel, and Jean, as you know, is a producer, a director, and a member of the board of directors of the American Theatre Wing. Brendan Gill, who is a member of the board of director, uh, directors of the American Theatre Wing. And Brendan is an author, a critic, a man about town, and a lover of the theatre. <laughs> will you now take it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll begin with the head of the West Wing line, <laughs> Miss Hughes, um, uh, Julie Hughes. I say that twice so that inside they'll know who to turn the camera on. <laughs> and, uh, and she looks so lovely, I wouldn't want her to be Miss. Miss Hughes is a principal of Hughes Moss, a casting agency that has cast more than 60 Broadway shows, including Will Rogers Follies, Grand Hotel, and Dancing at Lunasa. And next to her is that uh, very well known in the theater circles, Nancy Coyne. Nancy's been around a bit, 
and we all love her very much. <laughs> Miss Coyne is head of Sereno Coyne. Uh, it says venerable, but I'm not going to call it that. A good old-fashioned uh, New York ad agency specializing in theater advertising and wonderful theater advertising. And right next to me is an old friend, Bill Evans. Bill Evans is head of Bill Evans and Associates, a public relations firm specializing in press relations and publicity for the theater, and wonderfully well. M Mr. Evans. <laughs> and uh, on my right, and just be, uh, between Isabel and me, first of all, Tyler Gatchel, who was the general manager of Gatchel and Neufeld, a general management producing firm. And they're 22 years in the business. They've managed more than 85 off-Broadway, on-tour, and Broadway productions, including Sweeney Todd, Born Yesterday, and Lettuce and Lovage. And right next to me is Elizabeth Peck Williams, who in addition to Crazy for You, Miss Williams is currently represented on Broadway in The Secret Garden, which she co-produced with Heidi Landisman. Other <coughs> producing credits include Into the Woods and The Gospel at Colonus. Could I speak first? May I speak yes, first? Yes, please do. <laughs> All theater is complex. Even a one-man show is infinitely complex. But when you think of what a musical requires, it, it, it just simply beggars description. It's so difficult to imagine all the things you have to put together. And I don't know who would be the best person to begin by describing uh, this complexity. Certainly, uh, Crazy For You must have been one of the most complicated of all complicated musicals to put together. Uh, Tyler, would you like to begin by saying something about that, or would you rather well, have Elizabeth make the plunge? Uh, Elizabeth, you want to make the plunge in terms of how, how it got put together in the oh, beginning? That would be, yeah, the maybe beginning? you should do that. And Elizabeth, then, uh, you speak up. From the beginning? Yeah. yeah. From the beginning. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the word. <laughs> <laughs> and the music. Yeah. And the music. And the, the music, I think, is probably the place to start. It, it, this show was engendered primarily through a um, fan club. A, Gershwin fan club that my co-producer Roger Horchow and I um, participated in through the years. He, Roger was an old friend and an investor in many shows that I'd been involved in um, from the beginning of my, my time in the theater and would frequently um, call me and say, you know, Elizabeth, we really must revive uh, Girl Crazy. And we'd then go ahead, I'd usually push him into a discussion of Gershwin music because Girl Crazy is a property, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's been, many, many people have tried through the years to work on this revival and very bright people, very accomplished people, and it's never been successful. It was a, a show of 1931 on Broadway that has, yes. has never been on Broadway since, mm -hmm. so far as That's I right. know. It's been done in regional theater with a revised book, somewhat revised, without the blessing of the Gershwin family, I might add. And um, we um, <coughs> talked about this through the years. And then at a certain juncture, um, due to several circumstances, including a proposed series of revivals at City Center that Tony yes. Licocci was mm -hmm. going to attempt, based on your mm -hmm. um, series of the yes. 1950s, I introduced Roger to Tony McCochi at City Center, thinking that perhaps this um, revival could be done there. And in then writing for, to find out if we could get the rights, I proposed a ra radical revision of the book, turning it into a farce that would really support the music in, from the viewpoint of a book that used the music to progress both the, um, the performer's emotions as well as the plot of the book. And to our amazement, the Gershwins wrote back and said, change the book. Um, it's a good idea. You have our blessings. And then began the negotiations with the Gershwins for the, for the rights. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a long and, and arduous process. So that was the genesis. And then uh, Roger himself, uh, your co-producer, had always been interested in Gershwin anyway, always. and is himself a, a, a player of Gershwin, yes, he a is. pianist, yes, he a is. skill and talent. Indeed. And, and so his, his interest was uh, going to brook no interference if he could possibly not be a So that was good. Ard just an ardent, ardent Gershwin fan, yeah. and had actually met George Gershwin when he was five years old. Mm -hmm. his, the family piano became sort of a shrine mm -hmm. because George Gershwin had played on it um, in Cincinnati. And, uh, so 
it's very very long and um, loving. And now, what, it, me. it really never uh, began with any kind of a story, you know, um, to base it on, as most musicals do. It was based on the stars who were going to be in it to give them all good parts. And exactly. that's why it's always been so difficult, why I couldn't do it at City Center. I just couldn't find stars that fitted those songs, you that's know? Right. And then in the old days, this is also a pre Rogers and Hammerstein kind yes. of thing, where a real story was going to be attempt to be told by a musical, which is a very ambitious new notion in the world. And this was really, I suppose, one of the last of the old-fashioned ones, which were where they would cobble up a book uh, for the stars, right. and the story could be, uh, no matter how preposterous, uh, if it would carry you from A to B to C to D. And a wonderful man, Guy Bolton, was involved with this, but, it, but he was uh, wonderfully, giftedly unscrupulous in just putting nonsense together, mm -hmm. and I think that would have made everybody very impatient indeed. It's so that good. your device of not being untrue to the song, mm -hmm. but, but finding yeah. the means of be not being untrue inside a farcical context was, was a, a brilliant choice. And apparently McGowan, even in the Jablonski bi biography of Gershwin, he actually, he said that when he heard the score, that he felt very embarrassed that he hadn't given them more to hang the songs on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, he actually, at the time, mm -hmm. realized that, yeah. that there was a discrepancy. Mm -hmm. that, you know, from the moment then you negotiated with the Gershwins, evidently successfully, and then uh, when was Ludwig called in? In the very big, actually Mike Cochran was first, first yeah. approach. And is that common? You, you choose a director, or, or is this case that was just a chance that Cochran and then uh, the book writer? Essentially Mike, with me and my girl, had um, both co-conceived the new book. I don't know how many people here have seen me and my girl, but me and my girl was the reworking of an old, um, an old musical, yeah. a very successful one, and Mike had both reconceived that book and as well directed it, and we we thought brilliantly. So we went to Mike initially, and he was very enthusiastic about the idea. Very shortly thereafter, we heard back from Kim Ludwig, who um, is he he was. We knew he was very interested in music because he had done a show called Sullivan and Gilbert, but he had never done a musical before, but he was a farceur from, I mean, obviously, Lindy a tenor mm -hmm. is in that great tradition. Mm -hmm. So he was um, someone we immediately approached. And he was able to achieve a lot of successful one-liners. There were a lot of jokes <laughs> in this. So. Glad to hear you think that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the audience thinks that. I mean, a lot of laughter just in one-line jokes. Yes. Right. And that's also uh, comparatively rare, I think, in musical comedy. Mm -hmm. You, you don't, you can't, you can have a plot, but the one-liners might not work. But they do in this case. Right. That's a great success. So in, you had your director, you had your story man, and then what's the next step after that? The choreographer. Thanks. And where did that, how did that befall? That took longer because we had a, um, Susan Stroman had always been someone we were very interested in, but very fortunately at that exact moment, um, Mr. Gatchel <laughs> had produced a show um, off Broadway called The Music of Candor, around, the, world goes and round, the, world, and the World Goes Round, and The World Goes Round with Candor and Ev, that Susan had, Stroh had, as she likes to be called, had, um, as I'm sure you know because she was just here, um, <laughs> she um, had choreographed this show and as well at the same time at Radio City, the Liza Minnelli show, mm -hmm. which she choreographed, choreographed brilliantly as well was on view. We, we had known her work from um, Kiss of the Spider Woman and other shows, but mm -hmm. these two really were pr provided a, a marvelous opportunity to see her work in action with and, Mike Ockren. And Susan brought in Peter Howard, didn't she? That's, that's and correct. And I think he was a great a deal of help choice. to everybody. Now, when we are talking about this, I, <clears throat> I neglected to ask you a critical question. When did all this begin? Because it usually takes a long yeah. time to get a musical uh, to stand up. So this was two years ago, do you suppose, or three? We wrote the letter to the Gershwins in the fall of um, 90, 90. Mm -hmm. that's right. mm -hmm. So that's two years. Yeah. Two so years. that's not too no, bad. Not bad you, you must have had experience of things that have lasted, uh, taken longer than that sure, to get. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, this one moves so quickly. Yeah. I mean, once the gears got going, um, it really went forward full mm -hmm. steam ahead. I mean, fortunately, uh, Roger and Elizabeth put together a team of people that uh, it's the most remarkable group of people working together. I mean, it's, I think it's 
a main ingredient of the success of the show. And their availability turned out more by luck than any other reason, that everybody had the ability to come together at a certain time and go forward. Mm -hmm. Can I interrupt you one minute? When you say you put together a team of people, what kind of a team? What, what were their functions? Well, the, well, Tyler's part of the, one of the, one of the things we, we're dealing now with just the creative right. team. And the, once we got the creative team in place, Mike Ockrent and Ken Ludwig immediately went to work on the book, and within five months had a had a second draft that was ready for a reading. It moved very very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And then you were able to acquire Paul Gemignani as the musical director. Paul Gemignani director. is the musical director. By that time, um, Susan Stroman was on board. And then Bill Braun then we joined had up. Bill Braun for orchestrations. Right. Um, during that summer, we put together the remain remaining members of the design team: Robin Wagner for the sets. Paul Gala for the lighting, William Ivy Long for the costumes. Right. And so by the, by the summer, we had sat down and begun our budgeting. And we had gone to Nancy and to Bill and to, well, Julie had been involved from the, from the beginning because with the right. casting, we had to begin immediately. Mm -hmm. um, that's another question. Even when you're starting the other things, you're already having to think desperately hard about the cast. As soon as you have that right. book in place, you well, know. It's the great jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. I mean, you really do have to have everything going on at once, and somehow, miraculously, sometimes, the pieces fit and it comes yeah. together and you go mm -hmm. forward. And Roger's commitment to, to, it, to the project was, was really crucial on many levels, and not only his, his vision of what this could be, but as well, he was always there Financially, yeah, financial Commit yeah. committed financially from the beginning, and that that I can't emphasize right. more. Because the conventional gave. wisdom in the in the business at the time when Roger and Elizabeth were putting the parts and elements together was, you know, well, what is this? I mean, is it a revival? What's mm -hmm. going on? And the common wisdom, of course, was, you, well, if it's a revival, you can't do it unless there are big stars in it. And you know, what yeah. is the reason for doing it? Mm -hmm. And with Roger and Elizabeth's passion behind it, and 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 Roger being there when we needed him. Uh, when I was engaged, my first function, of course, was to put a budget together, which, of course, terrified everybody. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we, we capitalized at seven and a half million dollars. A, a very major Ooh. decision was made um, by Roger and Elizabeth, which was very difficult to make, and I think is also uh, a reason uh, for the success of the musical, which is what used to happen all the time in the older days, which was going out of town. And of course, unfortunately, today, that's a very expensive endeavor. Yeah. I mean, just that element alone cost about a million and three quarters. Mm -hmm. Because with today's technical uh, situation with scenery and lights and costumes, the load-in periods are much more difficult than they used to be in an earlier time. And so you have a situation where you're going out of town, essentially, what the reasons that that is so good is that basically you have your entire company where you are at your disposal 24 hours a day. Their, their, their families are not involved. They don't go home at night. Everybody is in They're one. It, it, but, you yeah. know, yeah. the focus is totally on the show. Yeah. Yeah. And if there are little problems that are going along or whatever, they can be worked out in a relatively mm -hmm. private manner as opposed to here in New York City. I mean, it's just inevitable in New York if you're previewing, I mean, everybody's curiosity wants to know what's going on, and, and uh, it can be quite damaging, actually. You can, you can start something such as bad word of mouth that takes a great deal of time to get rid of if, if you know... It, that was a turn, very you know. wise decision on, on your part. I think and that's it was, very you know, And it was part of the reason for what the capitalization was, and, and without Roger and Elizabeth's real determination to do this show properly, um, uh, you know, you don't like to cite other shows, but other shows have decided not to go out of town simply because they didn't have the money to do it, right. and perhaps suffered a great deal because of that. It's nothing the matter with our talking about money. It's public information. Yes. And in point of fact, in, in, in Roger Horshaw's case, uh, as it has been written about and is publicly known, that he was determined to do this right, that he was determined Absolutely. to spend a lot of his own money on this, according to the newspaper accounts at least, mm -hmm. you know, the business of actually taking a vote in his own family, exactly. with the family voting, yes, go ahead, Pop, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, in any event, a man who made his own business, sold out at a very low, for a large sum of money, over, well over $100 million, has already given many millions of dollars to his alma mater, Yale, is a very exactly. generous man, and he was determined to do something of high quality, and he, and he wasn't going to fail. So it's thrilling 
uh, the story, the, the success story is based on something which is as good as... Yeah, as uh, well, he's also artist. a very practical businessman yes. because to be able to put into your budget going out of town is, I think, one of the most important things in a financial budget for a show. And if you don't, if you can't allocate money through that, then I think that you're under budget. <coughs> Particularly a musical. It's because short sighted you, you know, for it. Because you were asking earlier, you were talking about the size, the gargant. Mm -hmm. This is a huge Broadway musical. Yeah. It's, it's, well, you uh, can't believe the width of your curtain. Uh, uh, How big was the stage out of town? Uh, for, well, we played out of town. We played the um, Can you tell us where you were out of town? In Washington, D.C. Right. We, we played at the National Theater in Washington, D.C. Uh, was that which the first fortunately, place that, that mm -hmm. yes, only yes, place. and it's uh, we we particularly chose that city and that theater because the theater itself was in uh, in size the uh, almost the identical stage size as the Schubert Theater in New York. Mm -hmm. Another major uh, decision was also made about the show by Roger and Elizabeth, which again took some courage because financially, the Schubert Theater is not the ideal theater for the show. Um, it you know, it's, uh, it, it's peculiar to say, that, you know, the, the Schubert Theater, which has like always been my dream, I hope we're going to be in the yeah. Schubert Theater, is really not that large of a theater in 1992. I mean, financially, the show probably belongs in the Minskoff, yeah. you know, which yeah. would, and these were decisions that had to be seriously talked about because, um, because we're in the Schubert Theater, we're doing fabulous business, we're selling out, but it's going to take us quite a long time to get our money back. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a larger theater uh, with a more conventional seating, uh, you know, modern day seating arrangements, uh, it would have taken much less time. But the decision was taken to put this show and house it in an environment that was um, going to complement the show. Um, and the wonderful thing about the Schubert Theater is, is the relationship of the stage to the audience yeah. and the orchestra pit and the mm -hmm. height of the stage in relationship to the rake of the audience. And it's a very shallow theater. It's you know, not 200 mm -hmm. rows to the back row. I mean, when you're in the back row, you're still on the stage. Yeah. Well, and it feels so good. Mm -hmm. You know, there are wonderful, yeah, the wonderful seating, you know, upstairs as well, because you still have that same proximity to the stage. And you, people, you hear it every night. I mean, right. they just does jump up your, and down. Does your director come into that decision on, on well, where yes. the show and no how he like, where he'd no like to No question. The director and the designer, Robin Wagner, mm -hmm. um, uh, had a great deal to do with, with, with coaxing us into that decision. I mean, my job, of course, is very often the unpleasant task of saying, well, you're crazy. You can't go there. We should be going somewhere else because, you know, it, but it will take well over a year for us to, to get our money back. Mm -hmm. um, How many seats does the shoe have? It's, um, God, 14, 14, 14 right on the money because we had to move some seats around to, yeah. to make it work for us. Yeah. But, um, it, so that, that's another major decision that perhaps um, uh, a producer who may have done 12 or 15 shows and said, well, the hell with it, we're going to the Minskoff because I, that's how we're doing it. Yeah. And again, as you cited before, the, the passion of making this show right and the best. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, the, uh, these decisions went all the way down the line. Uh, you know, as you know, scenery and costumes and so forth have to go out for bid, and uh, it's Who not. Who sends that out? Well, I, I, as a general manager, I set that up, and the shops, of which unfortunately there are fewer and fewer and fewer mm -hmm. craftsmen. As you know, in the theater, everything is handmade. For uh, you, you just don't go out to a store and buy yeah. this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the decisions were made. Uh, based on financial decisions as well as who is the better shop for this particular show. I mean, it's not that any one shop is better than another, but certain shops are known for doing a certain kind of work. And so that was all in the process, part and parcel of the process of making well, these decisions. How long were you in Washington? Six well, months. we were six. scheduled to be there for six, six. wasn't it? We well, ended up to be five and a half. Yeah, five, it was, five, five, it was five, five, about five and a half. We, we, our, our goal, of course, was to uh, to have played there longer. It, it, after we got the show up in Washington, we realized the difficulty we would have getting back to New York. And we had a commitment to be back in New York um, by a certain time. And so we, we, de we determined that we should close earlier. We closed a half a week earlier in order to 
And yeah. you were doing great business there, I assume. In Washington? Yeah. Yes. By the time we left. Yeah. I was, the time we, outpost, I, I was, I was weeping when we were leaving. Oh, <laughs> 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 you when, couldn't get into the theater. When do we get that side here? Well, we, we, where does we, that we started with casting. Well, that's where it All right, that comes out, I want to know, on the tree, does that come out of... Do you well? Do what that basically was happening is before I was involved, <coughs> Julie and uh, the director and the producers and choreographer were, were casting away like crazy because uh, Julie went all over the place to Los Angeles and everywhere to look for people for this show, and you had special people to look for. Yes. So you were the first person of that, of that of, on, at least on this side of our stage, who was involved yes. almost from the very, very, very beginning. Now, is it, is it common to have to go from coast to coast and back and forth? And Nowadays it is, yeah. yes, particularly when uh, a show is as, as needy as this show is in terms of, of finding particularly the three leads that have to sing and dance and be funny and adorable and say wonderful words. This was, became a particularly difficult show to cast. Mm -hmm. And did you have any ideas uh, that were subsequently to be disappointed? How, how, how open was your mind to all the, Did you have 20 candidates? Well, I was very lucky, my partner and I, in that we thought of Harry Groner quite early on. Yeah, yeah. He was committed to a television show. And I called his agent probably in March or April, and I said, if something happens, I know it's going to be renewed and it's very successful, but I just want to put it out there because I think he can do this. As luck would have it, he did not return to the television show. Right at the crucial time where we were really mm -hmm. desperately searching and through the fact that we had worked with Harry in Oklahoma and we had a relationship with him, we got him a script and he ultimately uh, was seen in a production, you all saw him in a production in Los Angeles, uh, and then he came to New York and auditioned for us. and. We, it was just kismet that it happened that way. So that was, that was a first great relief. Yes, yeah. but we did an enormous amount of looking before because I didn't know he was going to be available. And from, from your barrel, did you, did you then do auditions? Do they still audition for? Oh, constantly. <laughs> constantly. And they all did? Everybody auditions. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. Everybody auditions now. I mean, there are very few human beings that are on Broadway now that have not auditioned. It may be private, there's some ways of doing it, but almost everybody... Does all the casting it. come from a casting agent, or do agents also submit their clients as well for the show? They know that there's uh, crazy views on, 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 on the um, boards, and, and so an agent says, I've got a client that I think would be just great. Does that have to go through a casting agent first, or well, if you're the casting agent, does it have to go through you, or does the agent just call the producer, call no, Tyler? No. no. We are kind of a, a semi-new phenomena, although mm -hmm. we're, we're growing a lot. We're casting directors, not agents. That There is a difference. Do uh, you want to explain that? Uh, we work for the producer. We work for the production. An agent works for their clients, their actor clients. Uh, Mike Ockren had remembered me from a production that we tried to get on several years ago of Carousel in London. He went to Elizabeth and Roger and said, I'd like you to meet Julian Barry. This is somebody I'd like to have cast the show. They came, they met us, it was wonderful. We started working immediately. I then got a script. I did a breakdown of characters, sent a breakdown out to the agents so they would know what we were looking for. They then send me their clients that they think are right for it. We then, of course, go back through our files and, and every show that we've ever cast to think of other people. And then we start the aud audition process and we learn an enormous amount by auditioning. An enormous amount. Auditions for you or auditions for them? I started off with them. Mm -hmm. um, because Mike doesn't live here, we had to do it in little clumps of time because he would come over fr from England. Um, but I would do, it was like three or four concentrated days at a time mm -hmm. with Stro and Jim and Yanni and Elizabeth and Roger and, and Mike and Ken. And with each, each time we read scenes, unfortunately what happened is it would go from let's just not have a funny person, let's have a tapping funny person. Let's have a jazz tapping funny person. Let's have a tall tapping. But we would learn what, what, what we needed. And always funny. <laughs> always funny, always funny. Ken wrote a funny script. So you were learning and changing and things uh, through an experience that none of us would even dream was happening. Way, way back there. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. That's wonderful. And he kept yeah. rewriting it, too. Yeah. He did. Yes, he we did. hear it, and he rewrote <laughs> it. Yeah. The, uh, Alan Alder, Alan Alder was saying the other day here that uh, he became a master of, of uh, you know, just auditions. doing the, uh, the preliminary, never getting to doing any of the acting, but auditions he became a master <laughs> of. And he hadn't any idea, he said, how hard it was to act. He just <laughs> learned how to audition. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, suppose so that's an art as well. It is. It's, it a, is. it's a separate art. Well, so I the would... thing was already taking shape in, in this respect, and, and it's indispensable then for, for a large number of you to be present at these auditions. You'd be because of this, of, of what you're learning. Yes, and, and as Tyler said, he and I have worked on an enormous amount of shows over the three or four years we've been in this theater. <laughs> and this was one of the most loving, collaborative experiences I have ever had. Everybody listened to everybody. Everybody paid attention. We all put our input in. It was a joy to audition, and some shows truly are not joys to audition. <clears throat> this was always wonderful. Must have scared you a little. I've been spoiled now. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, when do you come into the picture of this? It was, it was during the summer. The show was not yet cast because I know when we did mock-up ads, we were always writing in Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse <laughs> in. As a matter of fact, it, it hadn't been titled official. When we made our presentation to Roger and Elizabeth, um, we knew that the, the assignment was to position this show as a new Gershwin musical comedy because it was not, in fact, a revival of Girl Crazy. So it was our decision to take a chance and retitle the show and lo and behold we called it crazy for you which was also the name floating around in their minds and i think that was the beginning of the of the relationship was when we realized we both thought the show should be called crazy for you mm -hmm. but we didn't have a cast at that time and what we did know was that it it was going to have a look and again what everybody's said here is is quite true the collaborative spirit and the attitude towards the show was unique and wonderful. I'm, I've always been of the opinion that you can tell by watching a show whether the motive for putting it on was greed or <laughs> to give a gift to the audience. Yeah. And it was clearly yeah. from the first time I met Elizabeth and Roger and heard about this show, the motive was to give the gift of Gershwin to everyone who would see the show. And it made it a real pleasure mm -hmm. to work on it. Write that down in your memoirs, the ones that were based on greed. I know you can't tell us. <laughs> I'm dying to know. <laughs> but it, it, it really was a joy to Do you work think on. that was because you were financially secure that uh, everyone could be relaxed about in the relationship they weren't concerned or worried. Well, that or was that was certainly a, more than certainly that. a part of it. When I first yeah. met Roger, I, I I introduced myself and I, I said, I know you must know my name because I've ordered enough things from your catalog. Yeah. I'm sure <laughs> somewhere in your office there's a, a little gold star next to my name. And certainly the notion that he was completely supportive of any quality decision that was made was a big yeah. contributing factor. But it takes I, more than I the I think cash. it is more. I think yeah. it's more than that, yeah. too, because as everybody's this collaborative thing. Uh, Roger and Elizabeth were very careful, and uh, I auditioned for my part. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they, Nancy, and Julie said, I okay. Okay. I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Julie <laughs> let me in. Yeah. Uh, and, and so <laughs> once they decided on who they felt was the best for them with this I project. I just there. How did you audition? What did you, what did you present? I you tapped. Tap. <laughs> <laughs> and then did you have uh, well, no, and they you ads on your shoes or something? They, they, um, <laughs> all of the press agents in town knew that this was happening and that this was coming in. And uh, some of them I saw in the elevators. I was going up and they were going down, uh, you know, meeting. <laughs> We'd come in and meet. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth's office called me, and I'm, I had no idea really that it was beyond Elizabeth, and they didn't tell me who the other gentleman was, or even if there wouldn't be one. And so I came up and um, was quickly introduced to Roger Horchow. And you know, it started start clicking, Roger, 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 Roger. <laughs> I, know, I know this name. You know? And so it took me a couple of minutes, but then I, I had it in place. And I think that was premeditated, probably, so that I didn't come in with a big Horchow tap dance you know, uh, <laughs> uh, and have it all figured out ahead of time. But what's, what's great, too, is this, it's a new team. This, this whole team, although all of us have been cross-referenced you know, in the past, this team with Roger and Elizabeth at the top is new. And the creative side, it's a new collaboration. And on the business side, and in that way, 
when it comes to these decisions about the best place to make the dress or the best artwork or the whatever it is, that there, we were allowed as the chosen experts in each field to collaborate in a major way, and the ultimate decision is with the producers. However, in this case, it, there was much more of a chance to, to get into it and talk about it. And, and then, of course, the more you talk about it, the more the ideas flow, and, and in each stage of it, um, from my point of view, um, there were different things that, that, that I, had, I could use. And, and one of them was Roger Horchow. And Elizabeth had a relationship with Roger Horchow. And Elizabeth has a producing track record, but Roger doesn't. And he is coming and now collaborating. He's a producer. And this, the Gershwin mythology, which is all true, um, of his childhood experience with George Gershwin and so forth. And I was able to get a lot of uh, genuine mileage out of here's this guy who made hundreds of millions of dollars starting in his garage wrapping the UPS packages himself in Dallas with his wife you know sending out the mail orders 21 years ago and here he is you know uh, at this point deciding this is what he wants to do and so that was really useful and, and uh, uh, I hope that we intelligently milked that you know uh, <laughs> because it's, it's a good aspect and another great thing about out of town was that without star stars at that time um, it was really about the show and about the music, and it was very clear very early on that Susan Stroman's work, our choreographer, was extraordinary, that something really special and new was happening here. So it allowed me to come back and do my endless telephone conversations with members of the press and the people who make decisions about who goes on what television show and what story gets written, and will they do it in advance or not, is that I was able to say, look, I just came back from Washington with this girl. It's, it's extraordinary. You know, send your spy now. You know, or call your friend in Washington, send them, and, and let them tell you. Don't take mine. And it was really, it was like a rock solid uh, foundation uh, mm -hmm. for us. That was one wonderful jumping off point. But I don't think that could have happened the same way had we just been in New York. So mm -hmm. that was just a, another mm -hmm. reason why. Well, this is something, evidently, from what you're all saying, very exceptional, even under the best circumstances in the theater, that all people can come together like this, that you all weave as a fabric of something that you all believe in. Is this then the beginning of a new team that will be, do you think, uh, ready for once and twice and three and four times counting? We're ready. <laughs> well, first, it sounds as if you were yeah. now it would be criminal not to have you all together. Well, you know, the other thing is, though, that, that what happens on stage, and standing in the back of the theater in Washington or at the Schubert is at the first act curtain people are delirious I mean they're so energized and so excited and I there's one other experience I've had that was like this but it was on a smaller scale which was Ain't Misbehaving which was 20 years ago more than 20 years ago where the previews were so electrifying I couldn't I couldn't believe how exciting it was and you know all of us you know work in 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 the trenches here year after year after year and not all of the shows are, are you know, that much fun or, or are all successful. But you go to this one and, and you drop in for five minutes if I got rhythm, you feel fine. You know, yeah. you know yes, this is good. This is worth, you know. Do you, do you create then the added the publicity based on what you've seen or do you create it on what you think is going to hit and I, I and really get think space? you have to do it based on the, what you actually have. I don't think you can yeah. invent it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the Susan Stroman asked the Horchow thing first and then the Susan Stroman thing and mm -hmm. later on there were you know, endless opportunities with this show of, of people. How did you know that Susan would be able to do this wonderful choreography in this larger scale from having seen the, just what she did before which was not anything like this. It was a tremendous foresight and, and, and to be able to look at what she's done and said yes she will be capable of doing this more than capable exciting to uh, that I, I'm, what was it that you it, saw what we I can tell you the things we were looking for and of course I don't think you can you can see the the germ of genius mm -hmm. and certainly her inventiveness and her humor were what we could see, both in the Candor and Epps show and in the Liza Minnelli show. I don't know if, how many of us here saw the Liza Minnelli show, but there was this drum number. Do you remember that drum number? Great. When, I saw that, when Mike and I saw that drum number, we went, 
<laughs> and we just seen Candor and Ebb, so it, we knew immediately. Because for this show, a choreographer with humor, with inventiveness, and then everything we'd heard about her as a collaborator was just extraordinary. And she is. She's yes. just a fine person Very good and addition. a wonderful collaborator. People in the, in, most of the people in the audience, given the passage of time over the years and what has happened in musical comedy, have never seen anything like that first act curtain. And went, oh, all those people are there, and the whole thing, the energy that was pouring off that stage. And, and people are delirious. They're taken out of themselves. They didn't know that this was a possibility, just right. in the terms of the composition of energy. Well, and also, I think that in 1992, where we are uh, awash with video, MTV, any number of opportunities of entertainment and records and recordings and everything else. And it's hard to differentiate even now what's being promoted sometimes. It's some kind of entertainment, but you don't know exactly what it is. This is what's worth putting your money down, and this you can't get anywhere else. And it's great to have a reminder. Um, it reminds me clearly of why I wanted to get involved in the first place. And you can lose sight of that. Right. But this is, if I you know, had uh, was able to say somebody, you know, this is your first Broadway show. What you know, what should I see for an experience in the theater, and hopefully to develop a habit of coming back, and so that you know that the theater lives on. That this would be it, because this is just uh, you feel so good, and it's so much fun, and 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 there's a lot of talent. I mean, the cast, the, there's a lot of talent on the stage, but as you're saying about the wit in, in Stroman's choreography. There's some uh, scenery that makes you laugh, yeah. you know. <laughs> There's a wit in the scenery, right. and it's just wonderful. And you can't get that shows. on television mm -hmm. or anywhere else. Can't I was grateful as an architectural preservationist to see that, that we even right. had the old Ziegfeld Theater right. designed by Joseph Urban. There is part of the set now. Right. There can't right. be many people in the whole world who care about that, but a tiny number of people. Look, they even yeah. got that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that was fun too. But everything was turned out to be fun. How do you define your two roles? Because they're they're close in a sense. Well, we work very closely you work together. together. Very much. Basically, um, if you if you see an item in the paper and it's not paid for, Bill's responsible for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, advertising is clearly the, the the paid portion of it. But we, I mean, we. It, Again, it's going to sound repetitive, but the collaborative effort in this particular show was unusual, right down to the making of the television commercial. Usually when, when I do a television commercial, when my agency does a television commercial, it's pretty much our responsibility to get the commercial on the air. In this case, we had both Mike Ockrent and Susan Stroman working with us as, as closely as any member of our team has ever done in the past. They were crucial. They worked out shots that were specifically designed for the camera. They worked fast and they knew just what they wanted. Mm -hmm. It was it was a delight. Right up to and including the point where we had a blackout in Washington <laughs> oh, and oh. everything stopped. It was the one thing that had never happened to us. <laughs> and um, we had to go back and shoot uh, d two days later yeah, an because of it. Failure. An actual power failure. Out. All of Washington went black for a couple of hours. And still, that didn't dampen anyone's spirits. The cast showed up on Wednesday again as though, as though why not? Mm -hmm. It was great. Do you have to make a decision when a show is so obviously a great hit as this one is about having to use television or you do anyway as a reinforcement? It's a tool. It's, it's like having a photo call. It's something you want to have, mm. like a three sheet or a window card or a television commercial, music beds for radio spots. You need to have a Could portfolio. You give us just a little, for instance, on a percentage breakdown out of 100%, how much for media, how much for television? I mean, what percentage goes into it? Can you do that? Or? In terms of, of the o overall advertising budget? Yes. Between, I, I think, Tyler, <coughs> what was the opening between? Well, we, our, our strategy, as you recall, was, was to have everything ready and in place so that when we got here to New York, we could just blitz. And we, uh, as Nancy said, we made our commercial out of town, uh, which was a great tool to have. And we started to air it the day of our first preview. And uh, that first flight was over three hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars. The commercial itself cost about one hundred and sixty-five thousand to make. It's a very expensive ordeal, but um, it was absolutely a great tool to have had because uh, simultaneously with the wonderful word of mouth coming from the theater, the television sparks people to buy sales instantly. So, as we were coming in from Washington, we had good word of mouth.
mm -hmm. and the the press that Bill had put in front of us coming, it started to snowball, and it, it, the whole thing was a very calculated thought process of but when does this start, when does this unusual start. Unusual as well. Unusual. I mean, right. We have not been able Many shows, again, to handle it, don't show. have the resources that's to right. have the television commercial, right. or people are frightened You mean to, financial, that's exactly, right. Exactly. To, 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 to commit to, to saying, the, okay, take I'm the gonna, risk of that. I need 165000 for that, I'm going to have to have another 300000 for the airtime. They might want to wait and see how they do. Mm -hmm. And of course, the difficulty with that often is the catch-up time, and you never can catch up. Uh, and know, the quality of the spot is, is diminished often because you're you doing it so time. quickly. Yeah. That's right. You know, we had the time to edit this commercial properly. But it was a business decision. It was a produ you know, the producer yeah. said, "All right, Absolutely. here, here, here. These are the choices. Do we want to take this risk to ensure this? Mm -hmm. You know." And yes, they did, and and it turned out to be the right decision. Um, definitely. The last right. time I can recall a, a full blown, by which I mean a real good free sample of what's on the stage being on television at the time of the first preview was Evita. That's right. Which again, we, we, Tyler and we, we I did together. Ten, more than ten years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. And that so commercial it's was shot in San Francisco. That's right. Yeah. But so that the amount of money that it cost, if used properly as, as you did, and being lucky too, as you were with the Washington thing, is worth that enormous spice in the budget. It's, and how does that compare with media then? What, what do you have for your ABCs and the, and the rest? Oh, for print? Uh -huh. Well, the print on this show was not as heavy as the television. Obviously, in television, you can show what makes the show great. Uh, you can hear the music. I've never been able to pull off a print ad that could actually sing to you. But you can, you can hear the, the Gershwin, I Got Rhythm on well, the television. Well, I can if you read the music. Right? <laughs> that's 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 like that's the notes, too. Da, 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 da. <laughs> that was as close as we could come <laughs> to a singing three sheet. But, um, so, so the decision was made to, to put more weight on television. Um, I would say maybe two, three hundred thousand dollars props. About half of what was spent on television was spent in print. On print. But now, given that you have a hit, how important is it to have ads in the paper beyond simply the announcement? It's still an important factor, mostly because people regard that paper, the Sunday Times and the Weekday Times, as the place to look for theater information. Mm -hmm. and in addition I mean, to if that, you ask people what they think about the ABCs, the theatrical directory on the street, they all think that's a service provided by the New York Times. Mm -hmm. yeah. No one realizes that the shows pay dearly for that space. <laughs> They'll find out when they die. That <laughs> <laughs> really yeah, runs But the rates are better die. on that page. <laughs> <laughs> but in addition to that, too, the, the, the print, uh, unfortunately, the television, which is a great tool, is only a scene within the metropolitan, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, within the tri-state area. And so the newspaper, particularly the Sunday Times, is what we call the national, you know, I mean, that is how the rest of the nation has the opportunity to know what's going on. And then that gets into you, Bill. The Sunday Times, or how important and how do you yeah, use I, them? I think that it's one of the most important things uh, because not only do the uh, potential ticket buyers read the Sunday Times, but every, forgive me, you, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, most critics who are going to review the show happen to see the Sunday Times before they review the show. And many times they'll read that piece. And sometimes you can get in trouble. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did a play one time where the, the uh, writer of the play enumerated you know, all these points about the play is about boom, 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 boom. And all the reviews said, contrary to what the playwright thought, <laughs> <in the> Sunday <laughs> Times, the play is not about this. Yeah. So it's, it's a little yeah. dicey, but that's, that's what the risk was, uh, you know, uh, uh, alerting people that you have relationships with and saying, look, I think you, got, you should go down and see Stroman. And so they went and they decided that was a worthwhile thing. They did a piece with a sidebar of Roger Horchow um, that was in the Sunday Times. And I think that it set it up really well because yeah. she, this is like new girl in town, you know, right. and, and she's a very sweet, modest girl, you know, and she's great, and, but, and, but she's not jaded and the excitement and the enthusiasm, I think, came across in that. So I think that piece is crucial. I think it's just... Uh, what about your relationship with the people that you, with the working press? Do you, how do you use that from your record? Do you make calls? Do you... Well, I'm don't in. Don't tell me anything I don't want to hear. I would. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I wouldn't. Yeah. Um, 
just like the work anybody does in any business, you are constantly, those of us in the trenches, the people in the New York Times are in their trenches, and the New Yorker and everywhere else, their job is to put out the magazine or the paper and they got to fill the Is it an space. idea that you have to pitch to them or something different that would titillate them and, and say Sometimes, yes. but I, I have, hopefully, I mean, these ongoing relationships that I have aren't just about one show. It's about overall, and they know me and I know them to some degree, that, that they can, when I'm enthusiastic or, or share a certain mm -hmm. point of view about something, that they, they will take into consideration what they know about me or, or what, how they dealt with me before. And I'm not one to overhype. It's just not in my, uh, I don't know what, upbringing or <laughs> something. But I don't. I mean, I'm, I come from the other side, usually. Uh, and uh, there are people who are comfortable with that. There are certain producers who absolutely do not want that approach. Um, but I think, for me, it, it works because they trust, they tend to trust, you know, right. what, what I'm hopefully uh, putting across. But I don't believe in, I don't know if you're asking about gimmicks or, or, or real stunt, stunt approaches. I don't, I'm not good at that. And I don't, I, I have to really relate to what's going on in the show. Well, you've um, got a track record, too, which is the important thing. As you said, you don't over -hype. So they know that. I think you know, the whole thing is more serious than it used to be anyway. Yes. I remember uh, Dick Maney, that rascal, mm -hmm. who would right. make up anything that right. came into his head, right. you know, right. and it would be printed at yes. the time. Oh, yeah. But nowadays we don't, don't, do, don't do things like no. that anymore. No. So it is trust, and, mm -hmm. and it couldn't be violated. And there are, there are places where, and not just the New York Times, but in television outlets and in magazines, where the editorial people become excited, and sometimes it turns out so does the critic, and in our case, for the New York Times, I mean, on, on opening nights, I personally walk down to 43rd Street between 8th and 9th, and, and uh, Broadway and 8th, rather, and wait for the man in the trolley to come down with a stack of papers and put them in the machine and buy the thing and read it, you know. And uh, we used to get them in advance, but they've locked up the computer system. Uh, and this was, you know, oftentimes it's not a happy walk back to Broadway, you know, and wherever you're going, the party of the ad agency. And this one, I'm standing under a lamppost on 43rd Street, and I, I love the show. And I'm reading this, and he, he likes this, he really likes this show. At the end, he, he says, so I'll, I'm paraphrasing, but, but you can't blame theater goers uh, for thinking this is the second coming. And, uh, the second coming. <laughs> 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 this is what we dream about. You know? and so it, was it was an like, opening night, the likes of which we had, we had not great. had in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. People sit in the ad agency, and the Times, Bill usually runs in with the Times, then the news and the post follow, and up on the screens are all the television sets, and it's mm -hmm. it's usually the kind of situation where hopefully there there's enough good to offset the bad. <laughs> right. This was Not this was hope. all yeah. champagne, no uh, no black coffee, <laughs> just champagne. But it shared the real enthusiasm. I mean, that's the key. I think, especially on television, my theory is that it's more the presentation than the words. It's mm -hmm. if you see those people coming across the screen as they're excited, they just came back from a Broadway mm -hmm. opening or a preview or whatever, that it's it's almost the words are secondary. That if right. they get the feeling that wow, this is an exciting thing, that's what carries. What's going to happen also, which I think is interesting psychologically for the whole uh, audience and for the country as a whole, if you have two great hits like Guys and Dolls mm -hmm. and, and uh, Crazy for You. It's going to make everybody think that the theater has made a tremendous comeback, right. and then the theater will make a comeback. It may That's be just cool in my now. imagination, but if you walk around <laughs> on the street these nights, around 7 o'clock is about the time I get out of my office, and people are coming to the theater. It's like it was when I was a child and my parents brought me from Silver Spring to New York. <laughs> I feel that that's true. I, I, yeah, I think it's it being reborn. It's I an really event, too, and, and it, with the prices and so forth, it's very cliched, but if you're coming in from wherever you're coming in from, New Jersey, and it's your anniversary and you paid $60 for the tickets and the babysitter and the food and the, and the parking and all that stuff, and then this is, uh, it's a lot of money. And if you go and see, I mean, fill in the blank, um, <laughs> one that does really not deliver the goods, it's like, I'm never doing this again. Yeah. I'm, we're going to rent a video and stay home. Yeah, except I want everybody to come to the theater, not just for their anniversary. Oh, I agree. <laughs> I agree, but many times that's what they, uh, you know, I know, that's what it does affect you. Right. right. <laughs> but if they come in and see Crazy for Your Guys and Dolls, my theory is they're going to say, let's, let's, what's happening right. on Broadway? But a whole air change. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There is that, very right. definitely yeah. so. And it's, it's very important. Also, wonderful. too, the press changes their point. Yes, they do. Because the press mm -hmm. begins to write about the theater right. again. Very often, right. the press won't, you know, the, the outlets for the theater to be observed by the public right. is diminished so because of the lack of right. the number of newspapers and so forth. And the television uh, networks do not 
cover all of the shows. They don't really, I mean, they'll bounce a review in two minutes, uh, you know, mm -hmm. for an interview with Joan Collins, but... Mm. <laughs> or Let's not be well, specific. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's but, the other. But, Stars keep, you know, will come back to Broadway now if it's an exciting place to yeah, be. Oh, I hope yeah, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it, but it, it, it does change. The, the, the press then be, begins to write a little bit positively, right. too, which right. also makes people who work in the theater say, great, let's do some Right, and the street does come alive on a lot of different levels. And there are a lot of people, you know, the, the, the stars that are on Broadway now are bringing in people that wouldn't necessarily have done. There are Alec Baldwin people mm -hmm. who wouldn't necessarily have come mm -hmm. to see right. a play. And they I see mean, a great it, play. It, I mean, anybody would have predicted this a few years ago, because the doomsayers are always seem to be winning. Right. Right. Well, but the pendulum does have a tendency to swing back. Yeah. And so right. in our bleakest days where I thought, uh, I have an ad agency that's doing Broadway advertising. I have to be insane. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, but it, something has to happen. And sure. it did. And it did. We stayed with it. That's it did. We're going to have to take a break now, and uh, then we're going to come back, and there's going to be a lot of questions on the nitty-gritty. This has been very pleasant and very interesting, but we want to know the dollars and cents and the where it went and the unions and how they were involved in it, and uh, so I'm just preparing you for this. <laughs> I will just uh, stand up, take a break, and <laughs> come back as soon as we can. This is CUNY TV, Channel 75. We're coming back to the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre, which are coming to you from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. The American Theatre Wing has many programs. These seminars are but one of them. And one of the things that we do, along with our year-round programs, is go to hospitals and nursing homes and aid centers. And in the audience, I see some of the people that have come to these institutions for us. And one of them is Mark Nadler. And I'd like Mark to stand up and say <laughs> goodbye. Mark is a very gifted pianist and song and dance man, and he's been simply wonderful as he goes out to the hospitals for us. We are now talking about the production. This is a production seminar. The people that make everything come together. They have bring, we brought the performers, we have cast the show, we have the money for the show, and if the show is crazy for you that we're talking about, and the entire cast of what makes the show go on is with us, from the producer to the general manager to the uh, publicity and to the press and to the casting agent. And once more, Jean Dalrymple and Brendan Gill will continue the smooth path that they have to take <laughs> to well, bring it to Broadway. It's not a shining path, we're all right. Uh, one of the questions that I thought would be of interest me is the degree to which when you have a great success, like Crazy For You, whether any time can be spent fruitfully on imagining how long uh, a, a great hit is going to last, or do you have to make uh, any calculations in that kind, or, or are you simply grateful and go on and on year after year? You, <laughs> you don't have to book the theater beyond something, but what about the cast? What about all the other things? That, that if you were going to last, say, Cats has lasted eight years, nine years? We're going into our nine. tenth, tenth year yeah, in, in October. Well, uh, <laughs> what do you do about projections for the future? Well, one of the things that in casting this show and in, in working out in the beginning how to make it viable so that if we were fortunate enough to have a show that was um, going to have ticket buyers, <laughs> that we could run for a certain amount of time with the same cast. So we do have long contracts, if that, if that begins to answer your question. Yeah, that's part of it. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, but the longest contract, what is, is such a well, thing? Year. Well, we have a year from the official New York opening, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, considered in today's marketplace an, ex an extraordinary yeah, period of time. With our stars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a situation, uh, mm -hmm. it's, you really can't guess, uh, I mean, as far as any guides to help you. I mean, our situation is that we've achieved to 
have an advance of over $5 million, um, and that has been rather constant. I mean, it hasn't, you know, gone down. Uh, that is an excellent advance for today's musicals, and that's <laughs> going to be talking about, for want of a better word, the, the mega hits, as you would say, mm -hmm. like, like Phantom. Or, that kind of through you know, group sales? That, 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 that advance is through group sales, it's through theater parties, it's through single ticket buyers. Do you um, handle the group sales? No, okay. uh, we have a, a we, we, the Schubert organization has a group sales uh, department as well as we've engaged our own as well. Janet Robinson uh, does our theater parties. How does us. that? How do you get into groups for sales? Well, you, uh, it, it's a it's a whole separate area. Uh, they uh, market the show with the materials we provide for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they they deal with direct mail. Uh, they are involved in a lot of shows. Today, with the credit card system, uh, you know there are records of previous theater buyers, ticket buyers, and those those records are used to send direct mail to. You are using direct mail. Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, um, and with wonderful response for this show. Um, but you know, in terms of, of figuring out how long something is going to run, uh, you just you can't project too far ahead. You don't know. So there's so many other circumstances that dictate what happens to a show, uh, the, just the environment of, of, the, of the city itself, what's going on, what the business is like. Um, you know, people have lost and asked, well, how long is Cats going to run? Yeah. Well, now and forever is what we yeah. say. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and people have asked, how long is Crazy for You going to run? There is no answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's but a, you have it's to make plans in respect to casting, or if you were to be, if there were in the old days, it would be so many road right. companies that sometimes people right. would come in from that. Mm -hmm. Jean, you wanted to ask. I wanted to ask her. Uh, do you rehearse your understudies? Yes, we yes. do. Accidents do happen. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 and they and have. So yeah. embarrassing to see mm -hmm. understudies who haven't been rehearsed. Yes, we rehearse uh, basically on schedule. We rehearse every week. We rehearse. Oh, a, uh, splendid eight hours a week with the understudies and, and each of them have had an opportunity to basically do what they cover mm -hmm. completely. Uh, obviously that's difficult during the pre-Broadway time because you're so crazed trying to oh, get sure. the shows on. But even no. then the understudies are, are, are part of the show and they're perfectly aware of what's going on and in an emergency they certainly can go on. Yeah. And but, we, we uh, have had injuries. It's a very rigorous dance show mm -hmm. yeah. and we have and had you have injuries, dance injuries. And, right. Bouts As you know, we flu. have what we call swing performers for, yes, for the ensemble, mm -hmm. uh, who are remarkable people because their job is to know everybody's mm -hmm. part, right. yeah. because they go on for as many as two or three or four or five people, right. and uh, they have to be able to do all the dance steps in each position right. that they've been mm -hmm. choreographed in. Mm -hmm. And I'm always amazed that mm -hmm. they can do it, but they yeah. do. They're very, very, gifted, very what gifted, gifted people. Very gifted what is a general manager? Oh dear! <laughs> <laughs> what is a general manager? It's it, it's a it's it's a position that's come to be uh, in the theater in the last say fifteen to twenty years. In the sense that, in a prior time, uh, producers uh, were in the theater producing uh, on a much more uh, active level. Um, and people had careers and made their livelihoods out of producing. Whereas today, very often, I mean, you know, the legendary David Marrix and, and uh, you know, in the days when Robert Whitehead was very active yeah, yeah. and Kermit, Kermit Bloomgarden. Bloomgarden. And they had the ability to sustain the cost of um, maintaining an office with yeah, their manager, sure. with their press people. And so I'm, I'm sure this has probably sort of happened with the press world as well. Yeah. And what has happened since, since Productions are coming fewer and far between. A producer hasn't had the the ability to maintain an office that is fully staffed all the time, and as a result, people like myself or Bill or whatever, it, it's a situation where uh, we have set up our own offices and work for many producers, um, which allows. Uh, it, it's actually quite a good thing. My, my partner Peter Newfeld and I put our office together 22 years ago. We both worked for Manny Eisenberg and Gene Walsh uh, and worked our way up the ladder. Uh, and uh, essentially, what it, what's good about it, I think, in today is the fact that we do work on many shows. The, the, the knowledge and the information we acquire and the various 
problems that we have with any individual show is helpful on the next one. You yeah. may have solved one problem here, or you can anticipate problems that you might not have really thought about before if you've only worked for one producer. And, and, and various producers have various ways of working. Um, Roger and Elizabeth are very much involved in, in the day-to-day -day, uh, work of the, of the show. They're very much on top of the creative decisions, the business decisions. Other producers, um, for want of a better word, are more interested in the financial end, and they, they, and they leave the creative end to another group of people. I mean, each person has a different way of working. Um, and so in certain circumstances, a general manager, for want of a better word, is a producer for hire in terms of, yes, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what the film exactly. business calls that, but you know, mm -hmm. a line producer. Um, and in other instances, it's, it's, it's totally managerial and the producer is totally in charge. In this particular case, it's been a, a collaboration and mm -hmm. I think it's a, a situation where uh, what I've enjoyed about it, uh, and I think you have too, Elizabeth, is, is Roger having not worked in this business before. Mm -hmm. And it's always good to have a different point of view, and somebody saying, "Why? Well, why do you do that?" Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you say, and you know, you all of a sudden have that awful answer of, "Well, because we've always done it, and that's <laughs> not a good answer." You know? uh, and do you also then you involve yourself in the cost of of, of the production? Well, our our actual job <laughs> is first and foremost to put a budget together because mm -hmm. that is the that is the key to how you're going to go forward with the production. And the ability to to explain to the producer and the producer, depending on the circumstances, also knowing why you have allocated certain monies for certain things and why you feel you need this much money to get something on. I and think it would be interesting if you tell people what a budget is, what it involves, what it has. Well, I I could give you an, a sort of an overview. I mean, a big musical like like Crazy for You. Uh, was, budget, was budgeted and capitalized at seven and a half million dollars. Um, the goal was to bring it in at about six and a half, where, and we had a we had a, a million dollars reserve. It was a very tight budget because we knew it was a very big musical. You can't foresee everything, and you know so how do you say? Well, the set's going to cost whatever. You have to use a certain practical knowledge of what. The set cost on previous shows recently, and that's the other advantage of this system because we are always in the marketplace. Right. We're aware of, of, of what these costs can be, uh, and you're working in the blind because the set hasn't been designed yet, and neither of the costumes and so forth. In this particular show, um, we budgeted about uh, two million dollars for the physical production. And it turned out to cost about two and a half million dollars in the physical production. Uh, Good. I had miscalculated in the costume area because I hadn't realized there were going to be as many as we have, yeah. which is 235. <laughs> um, you were talking and earlier about too. the size of the, of the, the company. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, and you see these things happen during the process of the, even during the rehearsal period because the entire second act was rewritten a week before we left New York City. Mm -hmm. rehearsed and we opened in Washington with a new second mm -hmm. act. Well, mm -hmm. the costume house was if changing you, things. If you, know. you had known that before, could you have said, do we have to have this amount of people in there? Can we cut uh, and not so that uh, our, our budget for costume well, would be less? We actually did set? cut. We, we, there was a point what, that we wanted 31 people yeah. on stage. We have 29. We have 29. Mm -hmm. there, um, there were compromises. There are all always all compromises. Mm -hmm. um, That's an awful lot of people, though. Yeah. It is. It's more, again, like yeah. musicals used to be with Marshall. Right. But that budget basically is the superstructure for how everything is to go forward. Um, and then uh, my job is to try to adhere to that budget. Um, and the producer's job is to also try to adhere to that budget, but at the same time to make intelligent decisions. There are times where you know something should be done because it's better for the show. And you have to find this money from somewhere. And you may have to take it out. Maybe maybe Nancy gets shortchanged. Yeah. Nancy can't do that ad. We need that for. You know. Always me. <laughs> <laughs> She's a good one to start with. Who but arrives at the ticket price? Who it, who arrives at the ticket price? Wow. Well, basically, first of all, you have the size of the theater and the number of seats. Uh, second of all, you have what the marketplace mm -hmm. is at the moment, and 
you you back you into mean what it, everybody else is charging. charging right and why does that take place what everybody else is charging not every show costs the same why does every ticket not every show necessarily costs the same to put on but they all cost approximately the same to operate in terms of musical so uh that most musical i mean there are exceptions obviously but most musicals uh have a company of approximately our size, some have more. Uh, we have, as I said, 29 people on stage. We have 21 local stage hands. We have 11 production stage hands. We have 14 wardrobe dressers. We have uh, four hairdressers. It's, a, it, it's like a circus. Yeah. <laughs> and well, if you're ever backstage, I, it's a, you know. That's really what I meant by the budget. I didn't right. mean the amounts of money. Right. I mean, the many, many people. The and, personnel. And, the personnel. Yes. Well, and how it all mounts up to the Well, it mounts up. Amount. Again, you start off with a thought in mind about what it might be, again, from your previous experience. As the show is being designed, uh, your technical people are always questioning, you know, wait, how does this operate? Does it take two men to do this or four men? Or if these two, sometimes things happen during the course of a rehearsal process where all of a sudden you need two men to do one thing. And you say to the director, you're going to have to change that. It has to be done in sequence. They can't be done you at the same talking. time. Well, I go open this to questions because okay. I know there are many that <laughs> want to be safe. Well, you keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's it is. Uh, it, it, you asked about how do you determine? You figure out approximately what it is going to cost to operate, and uh, again, you apply what the general ticket price structure is in the business, and you see, oh, my God, we can't do the show. And then you start to figure out what you're going to do. In our particular case, we had to resort to what is called a, a pool formula for the royalty holders. Uh, the show could not have been done without the cooperation of the artistic personnel mm -hmm. because traditionally uh, royalties, etc., are taken from the gross box office receipts, a, a, a royalty pool situation which has been effect in effect in the business for maybe the last eight or nine years. Uh, depending on how progressive various people have chosen to be, is based uh, on their monies being uh, a part of what's left over after the expenses. And it allows, you see, the problem is there are only so many seats in the theater. You can't, it's not like, uh, you know, so a I'm, movie. I'm going to interrupt you for a moment so Surely. we can get some of the questions that we wanted to be asked. <laughs> you want to yes, my name is Peter Glebo, and my sister and I uh, produced Dream Girls over last summer. Okay. And my question is to the panel here. Um, is it still profitable to take a show out of town and bring it to a secondary city versus a major market city? Yes. To anybody on the... It is. Mm, it is. Cats is still out there. Uh -huh. uh, the second uh, bus and truck company has been out for five years. Fine. And uh, is doing very well. My question is to Elizabeth. Um, you had mentioned about obtaining the rights to the music from the Gershwin family, and I wondered for people who are not familiar with the step-by-step -step process, can you recommend a source for finding out that information of how you go about doing that? For, for this particular Not for, for in my case, in it's a different musical, the music from, say, West Side Story. And how you could how you would Right, obtain, obtain those rights. Right. For, for example, if you're, if you're dealing with music by a specific composer, mm -hmm. Normally, you would have to go to the estate that, or the individual that the living individual, um, the agent of that individual. If you're dealing with, a, unfortunately, a dead composer, as we as we were, we we dealt with the family and their representatives, and um, wrote initially requesting that we be able to use this material, and then when we received their uh, blessing on that, began the negotiations. Um, in regard to what kind of a production we wanted to do, if you want to do a first-class production, first, they're different. They're diff mm -hmm. different terminologies you'd have to use. Are you familiar with the source of, like, a book or anything that would list that kind of information or what to do specifically? Because I know it's too much to ask right no, now. No, I don't. You know, prob probably in this kind of a case, your law, your lawyer, if you have a lawyer. Okay. Or maybe the League. In fact, maybe the perhaps she could call the League, the League of, of American, of American um, the, right. Thank you. We Thank could you. give you that television. Or the Dramatist Guild. Okay. Or the Dramatist Guild. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Greg Kajaji, and this is also to Elizabeth. As a follow-up to the question Catherine just asked, um, is it often more difficult to obtain rights if, uh, say, you're going to do something on a smaller scale, if you're not going to target Broadway, you want to target off-Broadway, even off-off-Broadway, 
do you usually have more luck with obtaining rights or is there more difficulty if it's a Broadway show? Um, depends on the work, it? it does depend a lot on the work, as Tyler says. But I think, I think as well, when you're talking about commercial productions, and you're talking about commercial productions, not say in a not-for-profit venue, when you're talking about a production which might be there would be remuneration potential future profits mm -hmm. for that entity, that the the risk reward ratio becomes greater. Therefore the estate might be more concerned um, if it were for Broadway simply because the, the entity putting that together, if it did achieve it and did it poorly, might endanger the future rights, if you see my point. Right. So therefore, if, if you're thinking of off-Broadway with a potential move, say, to Broadway or in a not-for-profit venue for a move to off-Broadway, you know, perhaps there there would be um, more. I mean, obviously, it depends on each indi individual with whom you're dealing, but it, perhaps it would be less Thank arduous. You. Good afternoon. My name is Jane D.C. Julie Hughes, um, what is the essence of what you look for in an actor? How is it that you know that I'm the one for the part that's going to make this musical click? But in regards to Harry Groner and Jody Benson, there's a support cast of hundreds of other people. What makes it click? It's a hard question. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I think it starts, as I said, with the audition process and we learn a whole lot about what is needed and then I've been in the business a few years and I've seen a few performances that people have given and I've auditioned a lot of people and uh, I, I think it is strangely an instinctual thing based on what your show is and the people involved with the show. I had to find out what Mike and Stro and Ken wanted. And you know, I found out the key things that were they were most they were most interested in, and that's what I initially you know that's what I I, I looked for. You know, and it was humor, you know, the key word, beside the other talents. But there's just an, an, an innate humor in every person, from from those girls to mm -hmm. the cowboys right to Harry. They're all funny. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Harry. Hi, my name is Lawrence. My question is also to Julie. Um, how does one get involved in the Casting Society of America? And is it connected to London? And how did you get started in casting? That's two different questions. Oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> well, the Casting Society of America is, is, is a, a group of casting directors east and west coast. Um, that's probably about 300 strong now. And there are certain criteria for how many years you have been casting, and as we said, hands-on casting. I mean, you have to be totally responsible for, a f for films or television or theater for a period of time before you can become a member of the organization. And it's strictly a, a United States organization, as opposed to. And do you, how did you become connected? Uh, how does one become casting? Well, uh, <laughs> again, that's two questions. I became involved, I kind of just fell into it. I, I, I've been brought up in a, a theater family. My father was a stage manager. My mother was a sort of actress. But she hated to audition, so she didn't get very far. And I just kind of fell into it because casting became a business about 15 years ago, or really. And I, too, have my own office and work for, for many people. And, and it is not an easy field to get into now because there are lots of casting directors. And. Um this is open to the panel, but how does the initial audience, what audience do you target initially, and does that change over time? Well, I guess that's probably Nancy. Well, initially, with every show, we try to select a target audience that's specific to that show. My agency handles about 80% of the shows on Broadway, and each one we feel has a niche that they own. There is, quote, the theater-going audience, the people who go to see theater on a regular basis. Clearly, they make up the first audience for almost every show, and they're the easiest to target. They're the ones that are interested and will actually read the New York Times with an eye to, towards what they're going to see. But beyond that, we can broaden the audience of a show considerably with television, people who never read reviews, who do not care to pick up the Times. They are still watching television 
and they'll see 30 seconds of a show and they'll sit, make that, that leap that says, if I like those 30 seconds, the chances are I'll like the whole thing. So when I go to Broadway, Crazy for You is the show that I'm going to see. Okay. Thank you very much. Since we are talking about Crazy for You and, and how it came about, I'd like to ask just one quick question. Is when it first started with Roger Hershaw, had he, how did he come to you and come into the theater world? You um, were friends or he had been interested in the theater? He, I began in this business, actually I had a career change, I was an academic, I was mm -hmm. teaching. And an old acquaintance of mine was working at the time for a large corporation, this was back in the early 80s, that was putting together partnerships to raise money for art investment funds and theater and potentially film. And they came to me and asked me, I was teaching at Columbia, finishing my dissertation at the time, and um, came to me and asked me to be on the board of some art investment funds. And it, it, eventually, at any rate, they also were looking at theater projects, and Cameron McIntosh sent them a copy of the French version of Les Mis, and they, for whatever reasons, had been passing me things to read. I, we, we ended up doing this project together. Les Mis, we raised a third of the money for Les Mis in London, this company. And in trying to work with this company to sell this, these projects through their agents, it fell onto my shoulders to help raise money and onto the woman who brought me in, Karen Goodwin, into this, this show. So we began to go to Friends. And we ended up in Dallas, Texas, and met Roger. Roger put money in Les Mis. Roger put money in Les Mis, New York, and Phantom. Are there so, other investors in the show? Uh, yes, there are. Yes, there are. There are. Mm -hmm. But none to the extent that of Roger, they no. are really. No, I Roger. See. Roger. Well, there. I'd like to go on and on and on about this because there's so much more that I would want to ask and uh, there just isn't time. And so I'm going to have to finish now as I do once more by thanking everyone for being at the seminars on working in the theater, which are coming to you at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I'm Isabel Stevens, and I'm president of the American Theatre Wing, and I am indeed a lucky person to head an organization like this that I can call upon the people that we have on these seminars, from the performance seminar to the playwright and director and choreographer and to the producer seminar, the producers and the people that make it all come about of Crazy For You, which is now on Broadway. Thank you so much for being with us.